Hey folks, my name is Mo Amir and this is Van Culler, British Columbia's bonafide culture and politics TV talk show. Tonight is all about BC's changing political landscape with a focus on the provincial conservatives who are rising fast in the polls. But what do the BC conservatives actually stand for? Our featured guest is just the person to tell us, a former BC Minister of Aboriginal Relations and Reconciliation. He has sat in the BC legislature for nearly two decades, the long-standing MLA for Nechaco Lakes and the leader of the Conservative Party of British Columbia, he's John Rustad. John, hello. How are you doing today? I'm great. It's so nice to see you. Thanks for making the trip to Vancouver to see me. My pleasure. It's thanks for having me on the show here tonight. Absolutely. So I got to ask you, you have only been elected as a BC Liberal. Uh, you spent almost 20 years as a BC Liberal in office. I know your party is trying to differentiate itself from BC United, but what are the similarities between the BC Liberal Party that you were a part of and the current uh, Conservative Party of British Columbia? I suppose you could say in which decade was there similarities, because when I first joined the BC Liberal Party, it was a, it was a party that um, celebrated different voices. It was a party that had free votes. It was a party that uh, was able to bring differences together and, and have a venue for having those conversations, and that changed. Over the years, in particular under under the current leadership, that has changed. The free votes are not allowed. Okay. There was, for example, there was a vote in the legislature condemning the freedom movement and supporting all of the uh, all of the efforts that were done under COVID, including you know keeping families separated and what have you. Um, and uh, that vote uh, was sixty six to one, and there was a that was I was the only person who voted against that motion. And there was a number of BC United members that wanted to vote against it, and they were told not to. They were mm -hmm. actually told to leave the building. So I guess what I'm trying to figure out is if we're thinking about the BC Liberal Party that you were a part of, which decade closely mirrors your current Conservative Party? Well, British I would say Columbia? you know going back to the roots of the of the United or the BC Liberal Party when it actually brought together Conservatives and Liberals, brought people from across the spectrum together. That's more what we are about today in terms of the Conservative Party. Uh, and I would just say that you know the what they call themselves today the United Parties sort of lost their way. Uh, they have you know, for example, Kevin Falcon would come out and say his proudest moment was introduced to the carbon tax. And I was kicked out of the BC Liberal Party because I dared to sort of question this narrative, particularly around agriculture. And yet here they are now flip-flopping on their positions. So it's hard to know just who they are today because they are moving around so much on their policies. They aren't standing for principles. But as part of the government of the time, you were a proponent of the carbon tax. And another example is SOGI, sexual yep. orientation and gender identity in schools. You were part of a government that brought that in. So I'm just trying to figure out, is there a difference between the BC Conservatives and the old BC Liberal Party? Or did you have kind of an awakening and, and change your policy positions? Um, so I, I think there's, there's some of that, of course, when you're, when you're in a political party, um, and, you know, government's going in a direction, uh, sometimes you have to go along with that. When the carbon tax came in, for example, <clears throat> I spoke out in favor of the carbon tax because I believed in a consumption tax over income taxes. Mm -hmm. I thought that was, that was an okay to go. I also believed in a perspective that if, if we are going to have to put a price on carbon, can we use that to be able to advance forestry? see more investment in, in our forest sector. So that's why I thought about, okay, this can, I can see how this can help in my riding. It's a tax shift and it's about you know the opportunity to be able to enhance forestry. Well, of course, that quickly changed. The tax shift went completely out the door. You know, we started uh, bringing in more revenue than, uh, than we're going out. We kind of fudged the books uh, to allow for things like the film tax credit to be considered an offsetting to the carbon tax. So there's a bunch of things that went on there. So the carbon tax, of course, now is completely just a revenue generator for government. Things like SOGI, for example, when that was brought in by the uh, BC Liberals, in particular uh, uh, Mike Bernier, uh, there was no vote or no discussion on it. It was it came up in cabinet, and I remember having that cabinet meeting. And I was sitting close to Mike at the time, and uh, so Mike said, "Okay, we're going to introduce this." And I leaned over to Mike and said, "Well, Mike, what's this about?" He said, "Oh, it's nothing to worry about. It's just an anti-bullying program." I was like, "Oh, okay." You know, as a minister, you're so involved with your file, you don't get a chance to look into everything every other minister is sure, doing. So you trust fair. your colleagues. Yeah. And it wasn't until a couple of years later when I started seeing what it was doing that when it, wait a second, 
this isn't what I was told it was. Interesting. And so that's now why I've got uh, why I'm a place where I'm saying this has become too divisive. It actually has to be removed from our schools. We need to have something much more much better in place. Now, obviously, you're you're crisscrossing around the province and introducing yourself to British Columbians. For someone who hasn't met you or is not familiar with the BC Conservatives, give me the sixty second elevator pitch. What is your party all about? What do you stand for? So. Quite simply, it's not about being conservative or liberal or NDP or green for that matter. It's just standing for what's right, fighting for the average everyday person and being straight up, not trying to use the usual poly speak and things that you see from politicians. We just want to be straight up with people and stand on our principles and values that we think um, need to be implemented in British Columbia. And I want to clarify one thing. Is there an association, a formal association between the BC Conservatives and the Conservative Party of Canada? Yeah, the Conservative Party of British Columbia has no alignment with any of the federal parties. I mean, obviously, there is some policy uh, things that are the same. So, for example, we are very interested in taking a common sense approach. We want to axe the carbon tax. Um, that's obviously something that they want to do. That's good. But many things actually that we've been out talking about, things like parents' rights uh, and these types of things, we've been actually first in British Columbia talking about it, and they've actually followed suit in terms of some of their policies, mm -hmm. which is which is fine to do. You see that you know across the country. Uh, for example, we brought in the, the idea that we don't believe that we should have uh, any tax increases or um, or new taxes introduced unless it's done by referendum. And Daniel, any tax? Wow. Okay. No, no new taxes. Interesting. No, no, no increase in taxes. You have to go to the people and say, you know, do we have permission? Because the perspective is, we think people are taxed enough. You know, sure. affordability is a huge issue. We shouldn't be asking more from people. And so we, anyway, we introduced that concept last spring. Daniel Smith actually ran on it in, in her election in, in Alberta. So other provinces are looking at kind of initiatives we're doing and following suit. And that's, that's fine to see. So the BC budget came out last week. I know you're not a fan, but broad strokes, give me your key issues with the BC budget that was announced by so, Dave, uh, Premier David Eby. So let me let me say a couple of things that I actually liked in the budget to start with, because that's unusual to say. As a sure. Problem. Yeah. I, you know, normally we oppose everything. Like they put $250 million in over five years for the um, uh, Northwest uh, Community Benefit Alliance. And that's money that's going to go to a lot of communities that are really hurting, particularly because the forest sector is, is, has been hit so hard. So sure. that's that's one thing I'd say, you know, thank you for doing that. That's That's good. Um, the IVF uh, funding, uh, even though it's maybe not right away, uh, I think that's a good thing. But sometimes there are parents that struggle to have children, and uh, it's nice to be able to see that. But okay. you know, beyond those sort of things I look at and I say, okay, wait a second. So you're running a 10% deficit, and you've over-projected the, the growth in the province, which means if you underperform, we're going to be 10 or $12 billion in deficit, the largest in BC's history. Uh, that is borrowing from our kids to pay for these these tax handouts that they are doing to try to get, to try to buy your vote and i just look at that and i think that is just so wrong that's it the fiscal irresponsibility there is astounding so the only way you get out of a deficit either is either you raise revenue or you cut spending you've talked about not wanting to raise taxes so i'm assuming that's out what would you cut in terms of spending because you know, this is a, these aren't surgical cuts in terms of the the almost eight billion dollar deficit that we're seeing. So, what would you cut? So, there's a that's a that's a, a big question in terms of how you deal with things. I mean, we need to take a look at everything this government has done. They've increased the public service by close to fifty percent. Their spending on a per capita basis has gone up by uh, about forty percent. Their spending since twenty seventeen has gone up by seventy percent. And can anybody say that anything is better? So we need to be able to make sure those money, that money is being spent more efficiently. But we also need to be looking at revenue, and this is what's seriously missing from the, from the budget platform. Um, take mining, for example. There are 14 new mines in this province that are in the verge. They're either per permitted or they're ready to go. They'll be ready to go shortly. That represents a $38 billion investment. will create between 200 and 300,000 jobs, and over the life of those mines would add $800 billion to BC's GDP. And yet this budget talks about, well, we're going to create a critical mineral strategy and we're going to look at it and we're going to study it. We should be figuring out how do we fast track and get these things happening so that we can have the revenue we need to be able to get back to more a balanced approach. I'm having government. flashbacks to LNG and this idea of a prosperity fund that never really materialized yep. under Christy Clark. So, I mean, I think that's great to say, but at some point, if you want to stop the deficit today, don't you have to lop off some major services that the government provides? I, well, I think, first of all, I don't believe any government should be going in to do radical shifts because 
that would obviously create too many too much chaos for for people in the province, right? We need to look but look after people. We need to take care of people. But there are big shifts that we do need to do. For example, we got to get rid of things like the carbon tax. People are struggling Which to would put again, food deepen, on the deepen table. Deepen the bu- yes, uh, deficit, right? But people are struggling to put food on the table. They're struggling to pay their rent. Uh, they've got no hope to be able to put money aside for to buy a home or to, or for their future. We have to be able to give people hope. We need to be able to find ways to lessen the burden and create the opportunity for them to have more revenue. So there's a balance that needs to be found between that, between you know what is happening within government and our spending and how we're able to support people coupled with how we can grow our economy. What uh, I'm hearing, though, is that if you are premier by next year, which is possible, you would be still running a, a budget deficit. Yes, we would have to. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you, you can't take $8 billion out of a budget like that <laughs> overnight. Uh, but what we need to do is need to go in and have a critical look at what go- what this government is spending money on. Because if they've spent that much more money and we're not getting better services... Where are they spending the money? Yeah, I like, think that's a great question. And and that's but the only way to do that is you've got to get in, you've got to do a detailed look, and then you've got to make sure that the money is being spent, you know, it, as efficiently as possible. One of the big announcements from Budget Day was this idea of a flipping tax. Is your party in support of that? So that's people that buy a home and immediately sell it within two years. And there are some exceptions with regard to job loss and I think divorce and a yeah. few other things. So, I mean, there, there's there's all those sort of components that are in there. And, and if, if people are looking at um, uh, property as an investment, um, whether it's you know flipping or these types of things, of course, they should be taxed accordingly. I mean, but the biggest thing that we should be looking at is the, those components are very small in compared to the real problem that we have. And we've had a government that has taken the approach of socialism. Uh, they think that government, uh, that housing should be built by government. They don't seem to understand that the business sector is what builds rentals and what builds uh, the condos and, and this components that are needed. And you go talk to them and they're leaving the province. They're saying, we can't do business here, we're leaving the province. We have to figure out how we actually change that. We need to be able to look at strategic investments within communities to deal with things like water and sewer Mm. so that uh, we can maintain the costs or even bring down the costs of our development charges so that those costs don't get passed on to consumers. And we need to figure out how we use that as a tool to work with communities to bring down the wait times so that instead of it being three or four years for approval, we get it down to like six months or less for approval. And you have to be able to drive down that that structure in place so that people want to be able to do an investment in creating the housing that we need. Don't you have to reduce land costs, though, and that may affect the equity that people have in their homes and maybe put their mortgages underwater if you if there's too much of a correction in the market? No, and that's, and that's the balance that you need to find. So by doing these steps, the idea is to try to stabilize prices so that maybe they go up or down a small amount, but they, they stabilize so okay. that as we see wages increase and we need to be doing that in this province, um, you end up being in a situation where housing prices become stable, the ability to to pay, uh, to buy, you know, increases. And then there's some other tax measures that we're looking at that we want to put in place, which we'll be looking forward to rolling out in the months ahead. Fair enough. So to be very clear, yes or no, under your premiership, hypothetically, the flipping tax stays or goes away? I have to take a better a better look at just what it is that and how it's sort of structured in there. Uh, but in general, I, I do not oppose the idea of um, of putting a tax, uh, you know, where people are, are using a loophole to try to get tax-free revenue. What about the Airbnb restrictions? You've been against that, right? That's got to go. That's got to go? Yeah. Specul- I mean, look, okay. So let, yeah. let, for short-term rentals, let's look at it this way. The job of your elected municipal council, mayor and council, is to do zoning, is to structure how the community works, build an official community plan, you know, go out and engage with people create the opportunities, whether it's for tourism and other types of uh, business activities within the communities, that is their job. Sure. Now, if you're coming to the province and saying, no, I'm taking away your job, I'm saying, no, you shouldn't be doing that. I don't like that approach. That's an authoritarian approach by this government, and I don't, I don't agree with that. But it might be a popular one. Let me ask you about another popular tax. You got about 30 seconds, the spec and va- uh, vacancy tax. Does that stay or go if you're premier? That's the one that I have to look at again. I, I haven't, we haven't come um, to a decision on, on whether that is the right thing to do or not. What I do know is when you look at all of these things that they have put in place, they have done nothing to, to alleviate the housing crisis. That Certainly we have. not on their own. I would and agree so with we that. need yeah. to be looking actually at a different approach, which is the approach that we will be taking. John, this was a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much for making the trip to see me. I appreciate it. My pleasure. It. Anytime. Absolutely. Folks, he's the leader of the Conservative Party of British Columbia heading into BC's provincial election with a lot of momentum. He is John Rustad. Thank you to Shelter Point Single Malt Whiskey 
for supporting local conversations, including those with the leaders of provincial parties. Now, after some business, is British Columbia a conservative province? My friend JJ McCullough will be here to give us his thoughts up next.